And uh, I just, I just got to let you know that I, I'm excited. I, I'm, I'm really excited for what God has for us, not only today, uh, but in the next several weeks as we begin this new uh, journey, discovering what it means to be sent. And uh, today we're really just trying to set the stage for that and understand our nature. And I, I'll try not to be long because I know we've got some food in the back and everybody's hungry and that kind of thing. So, you know, I'll, I'll try to listen for stomach grumbling if I, if I go a little long or if you're like, pastor, you know, move on, you know, just raise your hand and I'll be like, I see that hand. Okay. But I see that hand. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, there's a, a famous phrase uh, I think most of us are familiar with where um, someone said, One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. How many of you have heard that phrase before? We're we're talking about when the first human being stepped foot on the moon. I mean, just think about that. Sometimes I'm outside at night and I'm looking up at the stars and I'm looking at the constellations and I can see the moon. Maybe it's a full moon. Maybe it's a half moon. But I look up there and sometimes I'm just like, A human being has stood on that moon. And I'm just like overwhelmed by that thought. I don't think I'm alone. I'm just like, my goodness, imagine just like all the work and effort that went into putting a human being on a moon. Like the Apollo 11 space rocket, 1969. Neil Armstrong, the first person to set foot on the moon plants a flag. Can, can you imagine what, what he would have been feeling? Like he'd been training with, with his team for like a year and a half and in all the money and all the training and all the everything else that went up there and, and finally he and his team successfully accomplished that mission. They did what they had set out to do. I think about that. That's just amazing to me. I also think about like, have you ever, have you ever seen like Mount Everest? Have you, anybody ever been to Mount Everest? Just curious, right? Have you, but you've seen it on pictures and in photographs and National Geographic and maybe you've watched the movie Everest or, you know, people like this giant mountain and somebody somewhere said, I wonder if I can make it to the top of that thing. Like, I, I don't know what they're thinking, but like, I wonder if I can make it to the top of that thing. And so they go into training and they, and they have a team and they work so hard and, and you know, 29,000 feet. And in 1963, Jim Whitaker would be the first among a U.S. team to also plant a flag atop Mount Everest. <laughs> and I mean, that's, those are just a couple examples. I mean, people, you got people flying around the world, you got people sailing around the world, you got people discovering all types of new and different things. And and if you look back over human history, you'll discover these moments, right? These feats where where men and women were sent off to accomplish absolutely extraordinary things. And even still today, like there's this drive within the human spirit to go, to discover, to explore. It's, it's almost as if it's in a, an innate part of human nature. And yet when we open the Bible and we, we look at Genesis and the creation account, we see this is literally how God created us. It's, it's a thread that is woven throughout the scriptures. You look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and The scripture says that God said, let us make human beings in our image and in our likeness and so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the the birds and the sky and over the livestock and all the the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image, in the image of God. He created them male and female. He created them. God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish 
in the sea, in the birds of the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And God said, I'll I'll give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They'll be for your fruit, for your food. And, And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw. He looked at all that he had made. Everything. Human beings, all of creation. He looked at it all. And it was very good. And there was evening and morning the sixth day. Now I want us to keep in mind, as, as we see here in God's act of creation, especially that of human beings being made in His image. And, and what does He do? He sends them into creation to partner in His rule over creation. Male and female, they're, they're created and they're sent. And they have dominion. This, this rule of creation that we see unfolding in, in this narrative. And, I, and as we see that, I want us to understand that's not so much domination or dominance as it is care. There's a guy by the name of John H. Walton, and he writes, more than anything else, subduing and ruling gives people the mission of bringing order to their world as God has brought order to the cosmos. Just let that sink in. Human beings are created with this innate sense of of being sent of bringing things into order, of helping things flourish, like we see in this passage with Adam and Eve. And when we do that, like when we help things flourish, when we order and structure things and help them to be as God intended to be and care for them like he intended us to care for them, we reflect our Creator. The image that he created us with. There's a, a guy by the name of Robert Mulholland Jr. And he wrote a book called Shaped by the Word. It, it's a fascinating book. And in his book, he points out this idea that human beings are a word from God. He, he looks at Paul's statement in Ephesians 4, or Ephesians 1, verse 4, that can be interpreted as God spoke us forth in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before God in love. God spoke things into existence. He spoke us into being. The implication being that if He spoke us into existence, He did so with a purpose. And that purpose is that we reflect His nature, His image to all of creation. That image is seen in both who we are and what we do. It's how we shape the world as spoken words of God. It's an interesting thought to see you and I as a word from God to creation, to order and help things flourish. And so one of the ways that we see this working out in our context today um, is when we actually go out into our surrounding communities, into our workplaces, into our families, and seek to be a blessing in those spaces. That's how we reflect the character and nature of God. That's how we live into our sentness. And as I thought about this, I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if like, we just kind of organized together and live that out on a specific day? Like just just for something to do, just like to live into that and to recognize together our calling to live sense out among our neighbors and our friends and our family. And the more I began to think about that, the more I thought, yeah, yeah, I think that would be an excellent thing to help us discover more about our sentness. And so I I looked at the calendar, I thought, October 5th, 
That's an away game for Clemson. So October 5th, I thought that's a good day, right? We're, we're going to go out into our community and we're going to try and bless people. We're going to try and, and shape people people in order and craft things in a way that would honor God and help people in our community flourish. And we're going to do that through prayer and service. And that could look like praying in spaces or over spaces where people gather. That could look like praying with people and business owners or in businesses or parks. Not like being annoying, but because I mean, Christians, we can be annoying. Let's just admit it. All right, but like actually going to spaces and be serious about how do we bless this place? How do we bless these individuals who gather here? How do we how do we pray over them? What are the needs? I think um, there's going to be a couple of significant things happening on that day. There, there's going to be a, a kids' day down in Seneca, and and I, I'm not saying like wear our welcome T-shirts and carry flags and blow up, blow a, a trumpet and be like ah you know we're here and we're taking it for the Lord, but like just. Just be down there and just be praying and talking to people and building relationships. Or like down, you know, downtown that day, I think there's like a, a, some kind of merchant like affair going on in Wahala. And you know, just be down there and, and building relationships and, and thinking about, you know, who might I meet today that I can pray with, that I can bless, that, that maybe I can serve in some way. And, and speaking of, of serving you know, uh, another opportunity we're going to present is, um, is serving at the Tomasi DAR School and Foothills Care Center. At, at Tomasi, there are opportunities to, you know, help with the grounds for those of you who maybe like to run chainsaws and those kinds of things. There's opportunities to do that. There's opportunities to paint and clean and, and fix things. Foothills Care Center, there's opportunities to maybe clean and organize and those kinds of things. And for, for our shoppers... Like maybe you want to get a van of people together and, you know, go buy a bunch of diapers or a bunch of baby outfits. I know we've been, been getting some car seats and blessing them in, in that capacity. But, but just think of some ways that we can get out into our community and live out that sin nature of God. I, I think uh, we're actually going to go to our daily rest on that day as well and prepare a, a meal for, for people in our community who are without a place to live right now. And, and we're just going to serve them in the name of Jesus. We're, we're going to minister to them. And, and I'm excited about that opportunity. And so, you know, as we move towards that October 5th date, I encourage you to be praying about and to be thinking about how you can live out that sentness of ordering and structuring and flourishing and, and, and that responsibility that God has given us to make that a reality where we live. Bottom line, my friends, it's, it's, it's in simple practices like this that we discover God at work. God at work, not only around us, but in us, through us. And as we develop these practices, not, not just an event, Right? Well, I participated in that check, right? Not just in an event, but in everyday life, we find inexplicable joy. A, a joy that is a result of our living out the mission of God in the world. Of, of leaning into who we designed and, and who we were created to be. And, and we're really, like, in that process, we're, we're hoping to hear stories. I've been talking about that and harping on it for a year. You know, we've got this box in the back. There's a text that you can text uh, type thing. There's a card you can email in. There's a place on our website that you can. We want to hear these stories of what God is doing, how God is at work in and among and, and through his people. Because we believe that as we share them and as we gather them together, that it's going to encourage not only us, it's going to encourage others to go out and make a difference for the kingdom and the world in which they live. Right? That, that planting of that flag on the moon, that, that planting of that, that flag on, on Mount Everest, it began with a step. 
it, it began with somebody saying, I'm, I'm going to move toward my calling. I'm going to move toward what I was created to do. Now, if we, if we look back at Scripture in Genesis uh, chapter 3, we, we learn that even though Adam and Eve like, bear the image of God and are, are sent into the world, it's not too long before they fail, right? <laughs> Good job, guys. Thank you. It's, it's not too long before they flow it, blow it, before they, they, they just ruin their sentence and, and fail to live into it. You remember Genesis 3? Right? Eve is in the garden when, when the serpent comes to her and speaks, which is you know, not an outrageous thing because the serpent, or the serpent is, a, is a divine being. And, and he suggests that Eve and her husband, Adam, eat this fruit from the tree that God told them not to eat from. And although they know they, they shouldn't eat from it, they begin to justify their actions because the fruit looks good. It's pleasing to the eye. It's, it's good for knowledge. And after all, it's food and, you know, who doesn't like food? So they both take a bite, and in so doing, they fail in that sentence. They fail in structuring and ordering and helping things flourish the way that God had designed. They sin, and instead of them shaping the world around them, which was their mission as image bearers to reflect God, the world ends up shaping them. See how that works? The world ends up shaping them. Instead of them living out their sentence, shaping the world, the world ends up shaping them. And as a result of their failure, God's got no choice but to send them out from the garden. So he says to the serpent, cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. You're going to crawl on your belly and you're going to eat the dust all the days of your life. And he says to the woman, I'm going to make your pains in childbearing very severe. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he'll rule over you. And then he says to Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of. Cursed is the ground because of you. And and again, they have to leave the garden. And yet notice, before they leave, the Lord makes garments of skin for Adam and and his wife, Eve. He, He clothes them. And friends, that is, that is so important for us to understand because in that action, even though they failed, even though there were consequences, he was removing their shame. He was removing their shame. No longer would they feel the guilt of shame because of their nakedness, but, but God would cover them. And although they failed in their sentness, if you look at the text, God never curses them. In fact, this is, this is so important because in the very next chapter, God actually blesses them with children. And those children continue to call on the name of the Lord, and their children call on the name of the Lord. That's captured in Genesis 4.26, which says, at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. I mean, here's your sign. It's right there. And even though... They failed in their sentence. Even though we often fail in our sentence, we recognize from the very beginning, God doesn't just leave us there. He's, he's still at work. He's still moving. He's still shaping. He's still ordering the world. He's still using us to do that. I, I, think, about, um, I think about it like Peter. Who when, when Jesus predicted his betrayal, when he said, Peter, you know, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna deny me. You're going to run away. You're going to turn against me. I know you're all gung-ho and, and you know, you, you said never. I'm, I'm never going to turn away from you. Even if I die, Peter, you're going to deny me. And he says, no way. It's, it's not going to happen. And that very night, Jesus is arrested. And what does Peter do? He runs away. And then he kind of wants to see what happens to Jesus. So he's following close behind. And, and then, you know, somebody sees him, spies him, a servant girl. She says, wait, wait, I, I've, I've seen you before. You're one of Jesus' followers. And what did, what did, what did Peter do? There was his opportunity. He said, no, no, I, you must be mistaken. 
That's my twin brother. Uh, you know, it's, it's not me. Right? He denies it that very night. I don't know who you're talking about. He, he kind of slips away at that moment, still trying to find out what's going on with Jesus. And this time a little bit further away. And then another person comes and says, I think I've seen you before. You look familiar. That's right. You were with Jesus, you know, when he, when he healed that one guy. You were with Jesus when, when, you know, we had all that food that was served to us and multiplied. You're one of his disciples. And Peter's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry, that, that, that wasn't me. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Must be some other guy. Slips away again, maybe a little bit further until another person calls him out and says, I know I've seen you with Jesus. You were that fisherman with the nets. And at that point, Peter begins to call down curses on himself out of fear. Right? He doesn't want to end up like Jesus. And then when the rooster crows in the early morning air, as the sun is coming up, he suddenly remembers Jesus' words. And all he can think about is shame and regret. Have you been there? Have you been in those moments where suddenly you realize that you're not ordering the world, you're not shaping the world, you're actually being shaped by it? You're actually perpetuating chaos and dysfunction, and there's a guilt, there's a, there's a shame that comes when we reflect the image of God in our life poorly. I know I've been there. And yet God doesn't desire that we sit in that shame, but that we move on from it. He wants to redeem that sense of shame and use it to teach us something about ourselves and others, just like with Adam and Eve, who didn't give up, but continued on to bless. Just just like with Peter, who didn't stay in hiding, but would repent and turn back to Jesus and, and go on to become one of, if not the most influential disciple captured in the New Testament writings. My, my friends, if, if you failed, right, if, you, if you're here this morning or you're watching online, and m- maybe you failed in some capacity, whether that's doing something you shouldn't do or, or failing to do what you know you should have done to help order and shape the world and help it flourish. And you feel that sense of shame. I want you to know God isn't finished yet. He's not, he's not done yet. We, we know this because if we go back to, to Genesis 6, we discover that in spite of Adam and Eve's uh, children calling on the name uh, of, the, of the Lord, as people increased in number and filled the earth, Satan continued to contend with God and led people astray, just like he did with Adam and Eve. And the world became so wicked and so violent that God decided to punish the sin of the people through a flood. And he sent the rains to come over the earth as judgment upon sin and wickedness, wickedness and and start over with one man and his family who lived faithfully. The Bible says who found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Do you recall that man was named Noah? He built this really big boat and he filled it with animals. And, And God would help them survive for 40 days and 40 nights in a torrential downpour. Every living thing was wiped out because the world had become so corrupt. And and whether you believe that flood was localized or whether you believe it was global, that's not the point. The point is God was faithful to Noah. And when the water receded and the ark came to rest on dry land, God made a new promise. He made a new covenant with with, uh, with Noah. A promise much like he made to Adam and Eve. We read it in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful 
and increase in number and fill the earth and, and, and the fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and, and all the birds in the sky and on every creature that moves along the ground and all the fish in the sea. They're given into your hands. Everything that, I, that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you green plants, I now give you everything as for you be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth, increase upon it. Does that sound like familiar language? Like it's the same covenant that he had made earlier on with with Adam and Eve. And now he says, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant, my promise. Never again will life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is the sign of the covenant. I've set my rainbow in the clouds, and whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures. And what we see here, friends, is God sending people out again just like he sent them the first time. We see God sending them out again. The same language that we read earlier on. Fill the earth. Multiply. And this time he gives more, more to accomplish the mission to help order and shape the world. He even puts a sign in the sky that reminds all of humanity of his covenant, of his promise to not just never flood the earth again, but to remind us of his provision and how he has provided and how he'll continue to provide. You see, every time we look up at the sky, and I love living in South Carolina because I feel like I see more rainbows than any other place I've ever lived. And every time I look up and I see that rainbow, it's not just a reminder that, hey, God's not going to flood the earth again. It's a reminder that I'm sent, that everybody who has been created in his image has been sent and has this calling to bless the people in the world and things around us to help it flourish the way that God intended. He's provided us with everything that we need to live In our sentness, just like Noah, just like Adam, just like Eve, God is faithful to equip us with all we need to go and live out our sentness to shape the world, to reach people who have yet to know him because he loves them. That's that's what the rainbow reminds us of, that we're sent We're sent by a loving God who loves people. That's who he is. He's ascending God. When I was uh, 11 years old, my dad started letting me walk around the woods with him. and, And he would give me this single shot 410 that would break down and I think I mentioned it a, a few weeks ago, and, you know, I'd, I'd carry it around the woods with me, and then when we happened upon a squirrel, he would, he would give me a shell, we'd put it in the shotgun, and I would have a chance to shoot the squirrel. We did a lot of squirrel hunting in the early days, and many Saturdays were out tromping around in the woods. And Dad even had a friend that would go with us on occasion. His, his name was Bob, and, and for whatever reason, Bob took a liking to me. He didn't have any grandchildren of of his own, and he he took a liking to me. And I remember the day there was this family heirloom that he had. It was a it was a knife, a buck knife he used for dressing deer. And he gave that to me, and it was special. I still use that knife today, and and I remember a little while later. He gave me this 22 rifle because we had spent so much time squirrel hunting. A little pump action, kind of old school type thing. And years went by after he had given me those things. And every time I'd bump into him on occasion, he'd ask me, are you using it? 
are, are you squirrel hunting? Are you using that 22 rifle I gave you to squirrel hunt? Are you, are you using that knife that, that I, I gave you? To, you know, are, are you using it? Because if I used it, it blessed him. It made him feel good. Like, like, like he passed it on to somebody who was worthy of receiving those things. He'd equip me with something. And when I used it, it brought him joy. I don't, I don't know if we, we see that connection here. But in the same way that, that Bob had equipped me for, for hunting and, and for being outdoors and for, for the mission, he wanted to see me going, actually living into it. And I kind of think God, see, God, God feels the same way when he gives us gifts and talents and abilities. And we use them for his kingdom, for his mission, for his purpose. He, de he desires for us to be going. To be using what he's blessed us with to bless others. Think about it. What do, what do you have? What has God given you that you can use to help other people find a relationship with him and, and his people? Perhaps it's a gift. Perhaps it's a talent. Perhaps it's resources. But whatever it is. We're called to use and develop what we have so as to shape the world. God has equipped us. The question is, are we going? Are we living in that sent nature? Are we embracing the very nature of our sending God? I know this hasn't been a super long message this morning. But I know it's an important one. It coincides a little bit with last week and the church caring for the hurting by reaching out. But, you know, as we close this morning, I want to leave us with just a couple of thoughts. First, it's been said that one can hardly read five chapters in the Bible without seeing the mission of God. You can hardly do that. You can hardly read five chapters in the Bible without seeing the mission of God. So I want to challenge us in the next few weeks that as we read the Bible in our personal lives, with our connection groups, with our families, and those kinds of things, to look for the mission of God in the text, who He's sending, where He's sending, how He's preparing the individuals that are being written about. And then share that. Share that with people around you. Share that with your family. Share it with your spouse. Share it with your friends. Write it down in your journal or, or maybe post it on social media to remind yourself and others that God is ascending God. And as we bear His image, we too are sent. Secondly, I would encourage us that when our connection folders come around, to just make an agreement to live the way that God calls us to live, to, to live sent out into the world, sent out in the community. And if, if that October 5th day is a day that you desire to do that, I, I would encourage you to write down sent in those connection folders. I'm going to go out on that day and I'm going to make a difference in my community. You know, maybe it's through an option here that we're offering here at the church, or maybe it's in a, in a different way. But just make that commitment between you and the Lord that this is what I'm going to do. We'll have more about that coming in, in future services and signups and those kinds of things. But, but if that's something you desire to lean into, I would encourage you to do that. And maybe that's out of your comfort zone. Maybe not. But as we do that together, as we live sent together, the practice of going will become an everyday part of our lives. That's the focus. That's the point. To embrace our nature of being sent into a world that desperately needs the hope of Jesus.